Um, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to, uh, to our panel today on uh, bridging the divide between psych and uh, the tech industry. Um, my name is Leigh Blitman, and uh, I'll start by introducing uh, our panel. We have uh, an amazing, amazing panel today. Um, from, uh, from your left, um, Dr. Alexis Fink is currently the senior leader with uh, talent, talent ma management at Intel, uh, addressing the talent lifecycle from onboarding through internal mobility and retention. Uh, previously, she has led uh, talent analytics functions at both Intel and Microsoft. Uh, she's a fre frequent author and presenter, a member of the editorial board for personnel psychology and serves as practice editor for indu industrial and organizational psychology. Um, Alexis earned her PhD in industrial and organizational psychology at Old Dominion University is a past chair of the IT survey group and affiliated uh, research scientist at USC Center for Effective Organizations, um, a current member of uh, the SIOP executive, executive board and a uh, SIOP uh, fellow. Dr. Andrew uh, Walkingshaw is a principal data scientist at Jaunt, where he leads a machine learning practice within Jaunt, uh, Jaunt R&D. Uh, previously, he was a data scientist at Flipboard, working on news uh, recommendation and modeling of user behavior. Uh, he's a co-founder and CEO of uh, Timetric, an economic data service now part of uh, Progressive Digital Media and a postdoctoral researcher in the Unilever Center for Molecular Science Informatics at the University of Cambridge. Uh, he received his PhD from uh, Cambridge in 2007 when he where he was an earth sciences student specializing in computational mineral uh, physics. Next, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Zach uh, Shandell. Uh, is the director of UX research at Netflix. His team uh, of consumer insights experts uh, seeks to give Netflix members uh, a front row seat at the uh, Netflix product innovation table. Uh, his goal is to bring joy to uh, their members through tactical and strategic uh, UI feature and algorithmic optimization, helping um, over 100 million global users of all ages find something great to watch. Um, previously, after receiving his PhD in cognitive psychology from Ohio State, Zach led uh, insights work across all five senses for um, other uh, billion dollar brands at Unilever and uh, Altria. And finally, uh, Dr. Daniel uh, Russell is a research scientist at Google where he uh, has been working in the area of research quality with a focus on understanding what makes uh, Google users happy, skilled, and competent in their use of web search. Uh, he's sometimes called a research anthropolo a search anthropologist because of his focus on understanding how people use the tools of technology to amplify their intelligence. Uh, prior to that, he has worked in various research uh, capacities at IBM, Xerox, and Apple. Um, he publishes widely with more than 100 articles and publications and, he's, uh, and is a f um, frequent subject of press interviews and has helped portray a great deal of complex technology uh, to a non-technical world. Dr. Russell received his BS in Information and Computer Science from UC Irvine and he, his MS and PhD uh, degrees in Computer Science from University of uh, Rochester. Uh, what we'll do today is uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have uh, two uh, parts to this uh, um, uh, to talk. Uh, the first will be uh, just a panel discussion among the panelists. Uh, well, it'll, it'll be f approximately half of the of, of our time, about 45 minutes. Uh, and then in the second half, we'll have a, a Q and A uh, where. Um, uh, you can ask uh, whatever questions you want to the panel. Hopefully, we'll have a great discussion um, around those questions. Um, as I mentioned, my name is uh, Leigh Blibman. Um, I'm on the faculty at the psychology department at uh, Lander College in New York, um, and I'm also a director of research at Zerk Prime. And so I wanted to just uh, get started by saying a few words about some of my own personal experiences with the interaction between um, you know, scientific work and, uh, and tech, um, just to provide an, illustra an illustration of what collaboration between tech and psychology can look like, and then I'll turn it over to the panel to talk about some of their experiences um, in their own work. Um, so Turk Prime is a, is a platform that provides uh, tools to help researchers uh, find online uh, research participants, and these research participants complete all kinds of paid work online. Um, and uh, in collecting uh, the, the, these data, we have uh, we have metadata on ten, tens of millions of paid tasks that were completed on our platform. Um, and recently, just in the last year, looking through these data, uh, we found something that was uh, completely unexpected. Um, and what we found was that there was a gender gap um, showing that uh, men get paid more than women on these online platforms. Now, of course, uh, a gender gap in and of itself is not uh, all 
that surprising since we know that it's uh, pretty ubiquitous. Uh, but what was particular, particularly surprising in finding this on our platform was that our platform um, is anonymous, anonymous, so that researchers uh, don't really know the gender or actually anything else about their participants prior to recruiting them. Um, and so what we're finding is that there's this gender wage gap uh, in, a, in a completely anonymous environment. Um, and so at first we thought this, this is a fluke and we could probably explain these data by just looking at different you know, biases in the data sets. But the more we um, looked into the data, the more we uh, analyzed it, uh, the more we saw that uh, the, the wage gap was actually very robust. Uh, we tried to kill it uh, with all kinds of statistical analyses, but no matter how hard, how hard we tried, we couldn't. Um, and um, and we consistently observed this uh, gender wage gap across all demographic groups. Um, and so at that point, uh, we decided to contact a gender scholar, uh, Lisa Bates from the Mailman uh, School of Public Health. Um, and through working with her, it further became evident that our database um, uh, had certain advantages over other extant sources of data that explores the gender wage gap because, because of all the data that we collect, uh, we actually had um, a lot of variables that we were able to hold constant within a, a single study uh, that typically is not possible in the way that this research, this research is done. Um, and so I just wanted to uh, open with that because I think that this provides um, j just an example of how uh, a data set that's really part of like the corporate sector uh, can provide an important contribution to our understanding uh, of the uh, mechanisms of something that's really int of, of interest within academia um, and has important implications for theory and, and for society at large. Uh, and again, what I wanted to illustrate here with this example is that industry has a lot of data that uh, are of key interest to scientists, and most importantly, that some data that are of interest to science are only available in the corporate sector. They can't be found really anywhere else. Um, and that is something that you know motiv should motivate the collaboration between psychological scientists and uh, the tech industry. Um, and to further elaborate on that point, uh, a recent study projected that there's something like 35 zettabytes of data that will be available in, 2000, in, in 2020 uh, generated uh, by the corporate sector. Um, and these data sources hold significant promise for advancing scholarship um, and for uh, also shaping impactful social uh, policies, uh, including health interventions and, in general, that are of interest to uh, the scientific community at large. Um, and so having uh, said a few words about some of my own experiences uh, with uh, data that are really in the kind of a corporate sector and how they can be potentially useful for scientific work. Um, I want to now turn to the panel and um, this question uh, for any of the panelists, uh, but um, the first question I wanted to ask was, uh, what are some of the concrete examples of projects that uh, you or your colleagues have worked on that benefited uh, from collaboration with uh, academia? When I think about concrete examples, they tend to fall in three categories. Um, the first is a place where an academic will bring some sort of capability that I don't have in-house. Either that's a methodological capability, it's a capability to be boundary spanning and tie my data with that of other similar or even dissimilar organizations. It's some kind of a capability that I either don't have in-house or it's not appropriate for me to get in-house with headcount constraints, et cetera. Um, so I'll give an example of that in a second. Um, the second is just a straight up capacity. So headcount constraints. I want to do another really big project. I can't hire the people to do it. Um, graduate students are a super cheap labor source. Uh, and I don't require headcount. All I need is the ability to write a check. I can usually get budget much more easily than I can get humans. So capability is the first. Capacity is the second. The third and trickier one is separation or segmentation. There are times when I don't want this data, um, particularly if it is data that's connecting. Um, sometimes I want a contractual wall between me and the analysis. I don't want anyone on the inside having access to something that's been connected in a way. Or um, I have a lifetime goal of never being deposed. Uh, so anything that's going into any kind of selection system, I prefer to have an outside firm where the depositions can just go to those scientists and I'll just be fat, dumb, and happy and, and not have to sweat in front of lawyers. Um, so with those as examples, if I go to a capability question, 
Oh, it's some really interesting analysis that we did about two years ago um, in partnership with Berkeley, where they had a fascinating methodology that it did longitudinal ericity uh, analysis around career paths. And we were looking at gender differences, and we were looking at types of careers, doing that longitudinally over folks, completely, like genuinely completely de-anonymized, anonymized, de-identified this data set. It was just, here are job codes and dates. Um, and then here's a, a generic, a couple of generic demographic identifiers, people in category X, people in category Z, key people in category this. Uh, so it was an entirely de-identified. Uh, de and we were able to gain some insights about the types of paths, the moments at which movement made the most sense, what that meant for where people ended up in their careers, and what kind of advice we would give folks, uh, in particular folks in different occupational classes, technical roles, non-technical roles, uh, people in different career stages, et cetera. Quite lovely. Not something I was going to be able to do here. They built some software that could do it. They had the capability to do that work. Um, there's another category where it would be just capacity. This is a much simpler example. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we had a fairly large strategic course planning uh, project, and we had an academic come in to do a good number of the interviews. Uh, it turns out that everybody thinks they can do an interview, and 99% of them are wrong. Um, so this was a gentleman that that was his entire, uh, his in, almost his entire practice, is looking at corporate strategy, translate, translating that into job structures. And so from a capacity standpoint, a little bit capability, but mostly capacity standpoint, I didn't have someone with sufficient gravitas and schedule flexibility to go and do this 100 senior leader interview, so we engaged with an academic to do that. The third example uh, in segmentation, this is going back uh, several years, um, it was a really, really large project we were doing that in the simplest terms was job analysis, although it's much more complicated than that. Uh, but the simplest terms of it was job analysis, and it was going to end up with performance management and selection and all kinds of other real uh, consequences, employment consequences for folks. And I really don't want to ever be deposed. Uh, and so in addition to having the capacity of bringing uh, some of those other folks involved. Um, I also very much wanted the segmentation of having, you know, the guy who helped write the uniform guidelines and is still an active professor help advise and do all the designs, supervise the analyses, tell us when we'd done enough iterations and we were good, uh, help us figure out when we needed to go back and revise something else to make sure that the underlying psychometrics were solid enough. Um, so in that case, it was very much a, a strong um, case of segmentation. And I think I think I've rambled enough for the moment. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so I don't have a huge amount to add to much of what Alexis just said, but one area that she didn't touch on, which I think is interesting, is that uh, I work in kind of product-focused roles in startups. So largely what I do is I make things. Uh, largely I make systems which predict things. And that tends to be a different problem from the traditional scientific problem, which is you're looking for some underlying mechanism. Uh, I largely care about predictive power. I'm trying to build a system which, for instance, my experience at Flipboard was trying to accurately predict what news people would read. So a lot of the collaboration with industry tends to be around methodology rather than data, precisely because the data is the source of the competitive advantage for the business. Often mm -hmm. the ability to train some predictive model to do something better than somebody else is because you have better data. But how do you know that the methods work? And that's a, a fruitful area of collaboration is open and public and shared data sets that are used for benchmarking methods. So to speak to one example, uh, which we're not currently working on at John, but was something we're very interested in is visual saliency. Uh, and that's a, a problem in the vision system and psychology where given some scene, it's where people are likely to look. So you want to train methods to predict this, given an image where are people going to focus attention. And in order to know whether your method works or not, what you want is some set of benchmark data where you can run through this and say, well, we predict people are going to look here, they look there, look at the various statistical measures, and that's the quality of the model. Uh, that work is all done in academia because Experimental psychology labs set themselves up with screens and with eye tracking and measure these data sets and make these data sets publicly available. Uh, often that work is funded by industry because industry wants these benchmark data sets to be, be available and it's a good for the entire industry and for academia to have common access to a common benchmark. So that's another area where there's often areas for collaboration is in setting up these open and public shared data sets that you can use for development and testing of models. 
Um, yeah, I've got a, a number of examples. Um, we were interested in measuring, uh, finding a question that could measure whether people truly had an emotional connection to the Netflix brand. And so we used a normed picture set that uh, evoked uh, actual negative and positive emotional reactions that we would measure through like heart rate, GSR, and like uh, facial mus muscle contractions um, in order to find people that had that positive emotional uh, reaction to Netflix and then basically had conversations with them to find out how they were different from people who didn't or had a neutral opinion of Netflix. And of course, this is just an example of a methodology that we don't have in-house or an expertise that we don't have in-house. Another one from my past role at Unilever, where we were focused a lot on um, anti-aging, was because you're in a really competitive environment with brands that have been around for sometimes hundreds of years, uh, you're trying to find new innovation targets to create new bioactives to improve uh, for white space, like anti-aging white space. And we worked with the uh, Frederick Gosselin from the University of Montreal to use the bubbles technique. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, you can Google it. Uh, essentially, it, it, it's you take a picture of yourself and then you show back that picture of yourself to people in degraded ways and only certain pixels come through these bubbles. And then we asked people to estimate how old the images were and then use that to determine what pixels on the face were making people look older than they actually were and what pixels were making them look younger than they actually were. So that's another example where usually when we're when when I've been um, collaborating with academics, it's been focused mostly on methodology expertise that we don't have. So I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the panel. Which okay. is that there's, uh, to, to, I work at Google and it's a little bit funny. We don't have particularly a divide between the psychologists or the academics in the universe and what we do. It's not uncommon for somebody to, to come in, who's a new hire, and say, this is more like grad school than grad school. And it is, and I understand why they say that, because we have seminars every day and you can go to too many, you can waste your life on colloquia. You know, that kind of thing. Uh, we have the food. We've got cookies. We've got a lot of flat food. Uh, we have, you know, lots of people sitting in very intense areas. We've got beach balls. You know, it's, it's a lot like grad school, actually. Um, but to the relationship, I think, between academia and, and Google, we, we, for example, have visiting faculty. So uh, I assume Intel does too, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, these people come... The idea is they come and live with us for a while and do some work on a product or research area, and then they go back. That's the idea. They don't always go home. We're not trying to poach faculty members, but sometimes, you know, they like it. Um, ideally, they go away and come back and go away and come back and go away. You, know, you establish a long-term relationship. Um, we also give grants to faculty members. Um, so we end up working. We have sponsors who work closely with a faculty member. I'll tell you a story, two, two quick stories. One of which is we gave um, electrical engineering department a grant to work on personal radar, which sounds crazy, but it's basically a low power radar to sense what, you, what a person is doing in a 3D space. Great idea, didn't work. But they discovered that they could use this to measure someone's breathing rate. And so they turned this into this greatest pivot I've seen in a long time. It was personal 3D modeling in three space to basically sleep apnea detector. Oh, interesting. Yeah, right. So basically you put it on your nightstand and it monitors you or your partners or dog. breathing or dog. Yeah, I mean, we can do dogs. <laughs> but it's a, it's a brilliant move, right? And so that's the kind of stuff that you get out of an unexpected turn in an academic piece of research. Um, we also, of course, have interns who come by. And to, to your point, Alexis, one of the things that we do like to do is not be deposed. Um, <laughs> and so one of the things that we love to work with academics on is studies of ki kids, because we're not really set up for that. So we gave a grant a while ago to um, the University of Maryland to do longitudinal studies of how kids change their search behavior as they mature. Turns out they change a lot from grade eight to 12. So we now have a deep understanding of how that works. And that would have not been possible without us giving a grant to a university and helping that particular student along. She now works in a group here. Um, one of the things we don't do is we don't share data. Uh, we've seen too many people get burned badly on this. Uh, and I'm not sure you can really de-anonymize any of our data. 
Uh, remember AOL and the data set? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, so do we. We're not gonna do that. So that's not to say we don't allow, for example, interns and faculty members access to our data, but we work very carefully on that. So for example, um, I had a PhD student who was working on search log data, the crown jewels, right? And she got her PhD doing an analytics tools for that. So ask me later, I can show you how to do it. There's a way to do it. You basically fake the data when yes. it goes to publication, but you have to use it you know, as a real tool in time. So we have a lot of connections, a lot of connections. And so I like your taxonomy, Alexis. I think that basically gives you the layout and then you've heard some examples from each of us. So as a follow-up on that, um, and this question is, uh, is, is for Alexis, um, what, what are the categories of uh, projects that tend to be um, useful versus those that tend to kind of either not go anywhere or tend to fail <laughs> um, or that tend to pose problems of, vari of various kinds? Um, and do you have any examples of projects? Um, and again, after Alexis, if, if any sure. of you, uh, other panel members, also have some ex examples of projects that, um, where you know you try to collaborate with uh, someone in academia, and then it ended up uh, failing for one reason or another. Um, so my success rate with projects where I have a need and I go out and, or my teams and I go out and find a partner, the success rate is pretty high. That usually works out. Uh, the success rate with being approached. Uh, and, and coming up with a project and having that come to fruition is probably somewhere in the single digits, um, which is really depressing for academics who want to come approach companies, right? I have this great idea. It's like, Meh. and somebody be like, well, okay, that's right. If I just twist my head and it's a Tuesday and I stand on one foot, I can see a way that that would work. Um, and very rarely does it tend to play out well. Um, just from my perspective, uh, either I've had to contort so heavily to get the permission or to get the funds that uh, the permission or funds will get yanked in the middle of the project when there's a leadership change or the, um, the this is typically more with student projects and faculty, the student will come come to a barrier that they can't get through methodologically or otherwise, or the faculty member will come up against something that we simply can't get through. So what I have found over almost 20 years of trying to do this is it works really well to have longstanding intellectually based relationships that make it possible to have the right collaboration when the stars align as opposed to trying to force something. And interestingly, um, I have long since lost count the number of times I've been approached with projects that are no cost to me, uh, and they are never no cost to me. They are always, oh my God, it's half of one researcher's time. And you know that's $100,000 of expense to me if I give a researcher half time, even if I give them my cheapest researcher. And it's not worth $100,000 to me. Um, so the, the challenge I have found, and this is where things like uh, Mechanical Turk become really interesting, the number of dissertation projects and master's projects, and I'm trying to get that last hump over tenure projects that have come to me that have been fruitful is zero. Um, it's super depressing. Uh, the number of times that I've had an intern that's doing work and then is close enough to the work to understand how to build a dissertation out of it is very, very high. Um, so I've had, um, dis uh, I've had uh, graduate students come in, do work, and also use a piece of that appropriately faked or whatever else for publication that works well. I've literally had zero success with trying to do something outside. And when we've actually, for me, success is utility back to me. When a project has been completed, half the time, the results are almost never useful back to the organization. So investing in the relationship ahead of time to understand what an organization needs, whether it's simple, something simple like onboarding, which I'm responsible for now, um, understanding the needs of the organization and understanding the amount of time and energy and political risk and legal risk that the organization is taking on means that we're not snobs saying no. Um, we are much more being pragmatic about a set of risks and rewards that come forward. So if you're advising students to go partner with organizations, it is much more fruitful to have ones that are doing sort of like a down low internship for a period of time before their formal internship. So then they can figure out how to do good work as part of that. So the, the relationship and the context for me has been the differentiator between the successful and the failure ones. Yeah, no, that's really great. I think um, something so, so, something you said uh, I think is, is very important it, the, that the, the researcher really needs to put in the kind of the effort and understanding what's in this for the 
yeah. for the organization. And it's not just, hey, free research, because it's not actually right. free research. Right. Um, do any of you uh, have your own experiences of projects that didn't go well for one reason or another? Uh, usually for me, it's logistics oriented. I know this is not interesting or sexy at all, but uh, you know, if someone says, uh, I will do this for you or with you, but I need to be able to publish it afterwards, or uh, yeah. if, if I do this with you, then my, my uh, university requires a, some kind of 50% additional charge in order to uh, use our lab space or something along those lines. And usually those things are kind of the death knell for projects. Uh, we're, we're heavily focused on uh, impact and secrecy. Uh, so we care about not something that's interesting, but something that's going to move the business forward and not something that's necessarily publishable, but is going to make money in the end. Uh, so in the, the cost thing is, is another piece like, like I gave you the example of that. I've had run into that a couple of times, and usually that's just the end of the discussion. I will say that the meanest thing you can say to me is that's interesting, because that means nothing's ever going to happen with it. Happen with it. <laughs> so I have very, as an intellectual person, I love interesting. In my work, interesting is the kiss of death. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's great. Isn't that depressing? It's terrible. <laughs> just to be clear, like, I love academics. I do a ton of academic partnership. I was responsible for our higher ed relationships for a while. I'm super jonesed about this but it has to be very, very appropriately focused and carefully managed. So just one thing to add to that is, it, to your point, the scale of the organization you're working with makes a large difference too. Yes. Because as you were saying, Alexis, $100,000 is a lot for you and your Intel. Intel is an exceptionally well-resourced organization. <laughs> uh, I work for a startup. It's a very well-resourced startup, a very successful startup, or about 110 people, Right. which means half of anyone is a lot and literally everyone doing everything is on, a cri on the critical path. They don't have time to give. And time is pressing. Mm -hmm. You know, we're a resource-constrained organization in a fairly dramatic way, as all startups are. So an academic coming to me saying, I'd like to collaborate on this, it almost doesn't matter how much I love the idea unless it is directly on the critical path for my business, yeah. unless it directly leads to Jaunt being more successful in the market. I'm not going to be able to justify it, and I'm not going to get my managers to be able to sign off on it. So right. that goes to a really interesting point and something that I end up beating into my new PhD hires. Um, the, um, the consulting skill to understand the problem someone else is facing and the value that you can add, as opposed to the going in proposition of, I have this value, surely someone can consume it. Right. Um, so it's just sort of a flip of the approach instead of, hey, look at my neat technology. Don't you want it? It's where are you in pain? What is your resource constraint? What's the thing you can't do right now where I can add capability or I can add capacity? The segmentation, probably less of an issue, but I can add capability because you don't know how to do this yet. You don't have the compute cluster to do it. You don't have the methodology to do it. You haven't developed the code, to, like whatever the thing is. Um, you've, you've got some capacity, some capability to offer that it's cheaper to buy than to build. Or from a straight up capacity standpoint, you can add cycles in a way that speeds the process or whatever else. So being clear about that value proposition, mm. if you think about the classic Peter Block, Flawless Consulting that I hope everyone has read, Peter Block loves consulting. It's like the Bible of this. Um, uh, figure out what your value prop is and be really uh, careful to hew to that. Let me build on that just a little bit. In fact, I think there's a lot of great comments. Um, we get some proposals like that as well. Of you know, uh, wouldn't you like this really great spell corrector? <laughs> <laughs> do you realize we have a spell corrector and it's the best in the world? Um, and so people don't do their homework. They don't understand what business Intel is in or, or Google is in, and they propose ridiculous things. So uh, in that case, we uniformly you know, thank you very much and goodbye. Um, but, but to your point, you know, the scale of the company really makes a very big difference in the way we think about it. So for us, $100,000 is kind of round off error on the Coke budget for one data center, right? So um, it's a very different kind of kind of thing. And as a side effect of that, we have a lot of interests. We also have a lot of different sort of companies and, and lines of business and so on. And so we hire, for example, social psychologists and cognitive psychologists. And I was telling Zach just before we walked on stage about a problem we had where 
we got a new perceptual psychologist out of Stanford who came in and solved the problem literally over a weekend because he had exactly the right background mm -hmm. to solve a really ridiculously difficult, to me, data analytics problem. So it's a bit of, of, of a dating matching problem, mm -hmm. but if your date doesn't know anything about your company, it's doomed to fail. Yeah. So, so again, you know, to reiterate, I, I think the relationship depends a lot on the size of the company, what they do, what they're interested in, and what, and what they can handle. So if you're going to propose something, think about that. There's also a really interesting flip side to the comments about um, small organizations. Um, there is, and I found in my own experience as a graduate student, as well as a lot of the graduate students that I'll sort of advise, um, there is a flexibility in your small to medium sized companies that aren't the hair on fire startups, but are the, you know, people who make napkins or whatever else, uh, that they often are capability constrained. Their entire, uh, if you're presuming you're managing, um, human problems here, their entire, uh, uh, HR department might be four people, um, as well as, so that's capacity constraint as well as capability constraint. Those four people, probably none of them have a significant um, analytical background. Um, so while uh, the technology face um, facing startups might not have the time or psychic energy to engage in many cases, um, there is an enormous opportunity for technology in other small organizations that often don't have the draconian headcount rules, et cetera. And I put myself through graduate school um, doing analytical problems for any number of small organizations. I was doing epidemiological research because the pediatric research center could hire somebody. And I did research for a, a small, small tech company um, that needed the kind of analytical stuff that I did. And they didn't have to go through 15 rounds of finance to bring an intern on for eight months. They just did it. Um, so there are really interesting opportunities um, to take in this case, an analytical skill and apply it if you can do the homework to find someone who has the need that you can fill instead of standing around with a need uh, trying to sell it or standing around with a capacity trying to sell it. I think this all comes down to just considering alignment of incentives, really. Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because academics have perfectly legitimate incentives as well. It's We all know academia is a discipline red in tooth and claw, <laughs> right? It's the... Academics are entrepreneurs and they raise funding by getting grants. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you have to publish impressive research and you need to get it cited and you need to do all of these things. And that's a very powerful set of imperatives, incentives that academics have. And startups, small companies in general, have an equally powerful set of kind of survival incentives which are not particularly aligned with that. So finding the areas where they do align is very powerful, but it requires quite a lot of flexibility and creativity on both sides, I believe. That, that, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. So it, it seems like, um, so I guess, I guess that brings me to the next question, which is like, so from the, from the point of view of academics, uh, what, what are the typical kinds of uh, things that will in, incentivize you know, academics to, to want to collaborate with, with industry? In other words, what, what, what are the things that are motivating them to to like reach out to you, for example, or why would they want to work with um, industry? So I actually don't get a lot of people who want to publish on the basis of a partnership with me because they know that that's a lower likelihood or it's not going to be a top tier publication because of the privacy constraints and whatnot. Um, in general, the people who will approach me are either looking for consulting money uh, or they're looking for student opportunities, either financial or experiential. And those are also very legitimate. Um, the opportunities to do top tier journal work that's empirically based inside of an organization um, are limited to those that are either pre-competitive, so it's fundamental research before it moves into a competitive product. And that's what we do on the um, deep, deep university partnerships on the technology side for Intel. We do an enormous amount of pre-competitive research, even in partnership with our, with our competing organizations. Um, pre-competitive research with academics, um, or it is entirely outside the bounds of competition, which is hard to find, frankly. Um, I would argue that, you know, like Google's famous studies about how do you set up your cafeteria, you could put into that, that area maybe, but I don't think those even ended up in journals, so. No, it's apprenticeship learning. Yeah. <laughs> basically. Yeah, basically. Uh, academics I've worked with have found it fun to see their work show up 
in the real world in something that people all, like we have over 100 million members at netflix yeah. globally they use it all the time and it's i think academics get a lot of intrinsic benefit from seeing something have a major effect mm -hmm. um so if you have your your phone you can pull up your netflix app and it there's like a, a black square with a red n that app icon i worked with an academic to do an implicit association task comparing our old icon, which was a white square with a tiny red word Netflix. Netflix that you couldn't read, you couldn't find on your phone, to find one that you could actually find and had a strong connection with the brand. And they tell me all the time it's fun because they know that they helped pick that app icon out of all the sets that we were trying to work on. I think broadly one of the the stories that gets told about why academics would want to collaborate, particularly with, I think, the three companies on this end of the table, is we sit on very large, mm -hmm. very rich, very precise data sets of human behavior. Right? That, that's the power of internet companies is that we, know what, we measure what you're doing. And we measure what we're doing, and therefore we try and serve you better by predicting what you're going to want next and accurately giving you it. The challenge with that is that puts us in a position where we have to be extremely careful with that data and extremely sensitive about how that is used because we've been placed in a position of great trust. Netflix, I mean, famously, there's a whole bunch of US law around people's video renting habits. It's true. I believe mm -hmm. there's particular legislation on that because it's extremely revealing of what people are interested in. It's library records. You know, this is, this is sensitive data. So... Often, I think there's a degree of optimism about in what you hear. Oh, yeah, no, given the state, we can do all these things. Is maybe in theory, but the consequences of a company releasing that data or being cavalier with that data are drastically bad. So it's not going to happen. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I'm just going to echo the same same thing and give a slightly different example, which is um, we do have a lot of user behavior data. Yeah. True, absolutely right. Um, because we're Google, we also have a lot of just data data. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, for example, you want every word published in English in the past 400 years in books? We have that data. You want to do a kind of cultural analysis of the evolution of word choices over different kinds of corpora? We can do that. That's just like an afternoon's work. So um, if you're an academic and you're doing culture studies, wow. You know, it's uh, it's not uncommon for a, an academic to come in and go, holy expletive, uh, I, I, you can do this, that kind of thing. And and yeah, and so if, if for example, you're an academic and you're working with one of our suite, our, our software engineers, uh, the kinds of power that gives you yes. analytically over the different corpora that we have is just phenomenal. It's the kind of thing you would never dream of as an academic. They can just do it. And that's the same kind of thing you see with Twitter, which, of course, is not nearely the same uh, corpora. Yeah. But, hey, how can I go and get this enormous amount of data that I can do analysis on that doesn't in any yeah. way uh, impinge on your competitive opportunity? Yeah, right. That's what exactly. Right. And, and I guess this, this brings uh, this issue of data sets, right, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which I think there's a whole bunch of questions that we, we could talk about. But I guess just a, pra a practical question. Let's say uh, there is a data set that can somehow be um, kind of shared um, and I, obviously, there's some questions around around sharing the data, data set in the first place. But how what, what does that look like? Like when 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 an academic is given access to a, to a data set? Like I know, like in Turk Prime, we have data sets, but to make that available, would, you know, to someone else would be would, would be basically useless to them and w without having some intermediary person to who has the, the you know the knowledge about how to like work with the data set, um, etc. So. The, can, can you talk about that a little bit? Like how? Yeah, I can. I can say a couple of things. Um, I'm also thinking about rep, rep, replicability. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't just hand you the, the Google Books corpus. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, it doesn't fit on a CD. You know. Uh, I mean, there's that problem. There's a capacity problem. But there's copyright, and so we are in an interesting era of regulatory overreach. I think. And the copyright issues just abound, even with, with data sets like, like that. So what we do with our academic relationship, our academic visitors, is to primarily give them access so they can do their analysis over whatever, say, images. Um, but we can't let them walk home with you know, an exabyte of images. 
Uh, so it, it's it, we do share data sets, but it's it's very very specific and very very but prescribed. Um, but it's it's a little bit like you have a candy store. So welcome to the candy store, and then you have to figure out how to academically describe that in a way that's acceptable for journal publication. Mm -hmm. But we do a lot of that, and and to your point, we we do have a lot of PhD students who come in, like like the woman I described, who come in and they cannot walk out with the data sets because right. you know what does it mean to have the Google query stream for the past twenty four hours. Um, a, we're not going to give it to you, but yes, you can do good science. So it's a problem, and I don't really have a great solution for it, other than to say you can be a faculty visiting and have access to it. It's just the way it is. The only time I've ever handed over a data set was that career eraticity one, which was just yeah. a string of sequential job titles. Uh, and then an elapsed time between them and and yeah, some it's other a very reduced completely data set. Yeah, yeah, completely yeah. anonymized for one specific analysis. Other than that, it's it's really hard for competitive reasons, for privacy reasons, for any other kinds of things. However, and I'd be interested in testing this with the panel. Uh, we got approval all the way up to the point of pulling the trigger, and then decided no one would believe we'd gone through this trouble. Um, but technologically, we've gone through and tested, can we create a data set that has identical measurement parameters to the real data set, but is actually entirely synthetic and contains no actual humans? Yeah, that's what we've done. Yeah, yeah. okay, that's good. What, I'm glad yeah. that you've done it, and we finally yeah. decided because it was human data and we were looking at things that people wouldn't want looked at, um, that no one would believe we'd actually gone to all of that trouble. Yeah. So one area where that's... Uh, Fairly standard, isn't it? Well, it's, it's a big area of research in the mis machine learning literature right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Is generating data sets like that particularly medical data yes precisely right. so being able to Cancer generate data. Yep. Uh, medical data sets so medical records that have the correct statistical properties but which are where no record is any individual patient's record precisely and it sounds like that's a yeah. thing you have in flight yeah. and it's a thing that right. your lawyers have said is okay and it's a thing that's reasonable to produce and we have to fight about it every single time that's what i figured <laughs> but it's a doable it's thing it is doable yeah Okay, great. And uh, just one more question before we go to uh, the Q&A uh, portion of the panel. Um, what, advice, what advice would you give scientists who may be interested in getting involved in projects? Uh, you've, met, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but addressing this question specifically. For me, I would say you should try to find a company that does uh, internships. Uh, Netflix mm -hmm. doesn't. Yeah. I know Google does. We do. probably do as well. Yeah, um, we do. Yeah, you do as well. And uh, get some practical experience applying your academic skills in industry settings. Uh, try to find ways of taking those complex methodologies or those data analysis skills and make an impact in industry. Uh, then you also have your foot in the door. I was just telling yeah, yeah. Uh, Dan earlier that I used to work at Unilever, which is more focused on skincare and anti-aging and like skin feel lotions, okay? And I was very interested in working at tech. Really, there's a lot of overlap because you're trying to find new innovation opportunities. It's product research. You do the same kind of methods, same kind of analysis skills. And it was difficult to break in to that tech world at the time. But as soon as I got into Netflix and I had Netflix on LinkedIn, yes. all of a sudden every job recruiter and <laughs> wanted to talk to me. And I swear, like it was like a month in, I'm like, I didn't learn anything in a month. I'm the exact same person as I was before, but making those connections and trying to find your foot in the door in that capacity is probably the best path. The additional plug I would put for the internship is given the um, liquidity of talent at the moment, and you're a good example of it, um, those relationships then form sort of a marvelous diaspora. So you may only have a set of relationships at a Unilever, but give it five years. Uh, and then those individuals are now spread across five other organizations and their former colleagues are spread across 25 organizations and thus. So you end up with a marvelous, um, a, a marvelous network that you can pull on um, that's quite helpful. So it pays dividends for decades in the future if you nurture the relationship properly. Don't be a jerk. I mean, we, we were discussing yeah. this before yeah, we yeah. came on the panel is the Yes. The way I wound up here in front of you all this morning <laughs> is that when I was an academic, I worked with uh, a friend of mine who was a researcher at Nature at the time. And he went from Nature to a startup, and I went to a startup, and we worked in the same building. We worked in some stuff, and he's now at Sage. Mm -hmm. 
Right. And despite the fact that our careers have taken this rather odd trajectory where I, I certainly didn't expect to be here at the American Psychological Society when I was studying earth sciences, uh, <laughs> there's been a kind of commonality in what we've been doing, which is understanding how people behave uh, when they're confronted with consumer applications. That has followed through our career, and we've had this fruitful kind of friendship, which occasionally has been a collaboration, which has been very valuable for me in career. And it's those kind of relationships which are never going to be where you expect. Exactly. It's, it's, it's going to be with someone you met in the tea room in your <laughs> apartment who went on to Google, and then they went on to Google, and they did a startup with somebody else, and they know someone. And you'll get an email three years later saying, you should meet this person. And then you do, and a collaboration comes out of that. Mm -hmm. You can't anticipate. You can't plan networking, right. is what I'm saying here. Mm -hmm. You just have to meet people and be interested. Five so, years ago, I was doing a good deal of pay parity research, which has made me suddenly very popular with a lot of my old friends. <laughs> um, so some of it is a little bit of luck as well. So I'm going to give you the fourth vote <laughs> pro-social here. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the, everything you've, you've heard is true. Uh, but one thing to keep in mind is uh, if you come to a Google, for example, and pitch your idea, I want to work on topic X, it's not cheating to get help. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's not in my interest or your interest for you to pitch me something which is, you know, completely off topic for, for Google. It's not Shark Tank. It's just, yeah, exactly. It's, I don't, I'm not going to buy into your company, but you know, we can go back and forth on the idea. Right. Okay. And so... Another interesting side effect of that is that, for example, you might pitch me a clever survey you want to do about some population. You want to ask them something. And I will say, well, maybe not that population, but maybe this population. And then you say, well, here's the method I want to use. And I can say something like, you know, we tried that method. We tried it with 10 million people, and it doesn't work in the following ways. And so that back and forth is, can be very, very informative because a lot of the stuff that people pitch me, we've already done with ends bigger than anything you can dream of, right? And so getting a little bit of that social interaction mm -hmm. to help target and be very specific on what you're doing is immensely valuable. Right. Don't undervalue it. So instead of walking in and saying, I'm an expert in X, Y, Z, and here's the carefully thought out study that I have already derived or devised, uh, it's much more about, I am really interested in problems of X, Y, Z, and, and what's the intractable thing that you've yeah. been stuck on, and, and what's the contribution I can make to your, right. your stuck spot, yes. like the person you hired who yeah. solved a problem in a weekend. Yeah. Right. Just to think about it in reverse as well, because I, I don't want us to come across as like, holier now and all this kind yeah. of stuff. It, uh, oftentimes when we approach academics, that's the, the same way. That's the approach yeah. that we try to take, which yeah. is I have this really difficult problem that I need to be solved. And I've read a paper of yours. It Precisely. seems like that's a method right. that right. might work. I don't know if you can apply it to this question. Can you help me please? That kind of conversation. I think it actually uh, makes the collaboration work pretty well. Precisely. Those yeah. problems of capability are always, hey, I'm stuck on this and you seem smart about it. Can yeah. you do something like this? Do you have a friend who could do something about this? What, you know, <laughs> is there someone you know who's good at this? That's right. If I knew how to do it, I'd do it myself. <laughs> um, okay, great. Uh, so now um, I want to I want to turn this over to uh, uh, to you. Uh, any, any questions uh, that you can have uh, for any of the panel members? You're totally skirting that pay parity thing, sir. <laughs> Are you going to come back to that? <laughs> okay. Absolutely. So uh, thank, thanks for um, sharing your perspectives. You've encouraged us to come to the table um, with uh, ideas or solutions to problems that people in companies are already working on. Um, what would you say uh, about um, uh, arise, arousing interest in uh, solutions to problems that people in companies don't know they have? Big fan of that. Yeah. Uh, like Dan said, uh, at least 75% of those conversations are things that we've done or thought of or tested with millions of people in A-B tests or something, and they've either been flat or failed. Um, but there is, there are nuggets in there sometimes that we get excited about. So I would say it's like try and try and try, and eventually something will break through. 
And I would say from a framing standpoint, I use the Henry Ford example of if I'd asked people what they want of what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse, right? Um, so how do you engage someone in a problem of transportation as opposed to saying, hey, do you want this automobile? Uh, it's the curiosity of what's your stuck problem? How do you do that? Oh, I've got this idea. Oh, you tried that? What about this size of that idea? Engaging in the dialogue. Yeah, an academic actually often can reframe a question or yes. a problem in a way that's really valuable. Yeah. But yeah, w one thing that really happens a lot at, at, at work is we get a new PhD in, mm -hmm. And they'll say, let's try, and it's that response. Oh yeah, that was yeah. that was so last year, we tried that, it's, yeah. it's totally flat, it's irrelevant. Um, but we don't publish that stuff, That's right? Because right? Right. Uh, we'd be constantly publishing, anyway, so it doesn't work. <laughs> yes, Mike. So uh, I'm halfway off topic uh, because I'm a combination of academic and counselor therapist. So I'm always interested in how to make people, individuals feel better. Mm -hmm. And of course, they also work for companies. So my question is, uh, how much do you perceive uh, that the collaboration is possible with the industry that you have experience with uh, in terms of offering um, some uh, workshops or seminars which are oriented towards well-being of the employees. So there's some organizations that go very deeply in well-being in a number of domains. Um, we have a whole runs every month. We start a new cohort doing our mindfulness at Intel is all about learn how to meditate and things. Um, I'm being I'm being a little flippant, but we embrace that heavily, as do many other organizations. Um, that's hard to do as a single academic. Uh, usually we want to have a contract that we can deliver uh, in many places. Um, the place that tends to be easier um, is uh, in an executive coaching framework um, where we'll engage with uh, sometimes hundreds of executive coaches. Here's our framework. Please teach it. We'll evaluate you and stop paying you $300 an hour if you don't toe the line. Um, but that's a place where a network of, 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 of academics or quasi-academics is often used. Uh, many places have their own external internals, but their contract with externals as well. Um, typically, you're not going to get a lot of uptake just looking at well-being, but looking at capability in ways that would contribute to well-being can make sense. I think, I think one of the benefits of working at Netflix is that we allow people the autonomy and freedom and access to all levels of the organization because the company is so small. Uh, and I've seen in the literature that giving people like a purpose mm -hmm. or, uh, or letting them make an impact and seeing the fruits of their work rather than uh, being like a wheel or in the cog, like gives them intrinsic value to going to work and making a difference every day. And I think the culture around Netflix allows people to gain that intrinsic benefit. And usually that uh, makes people feel like a lot better. Yeah, Google's got it very much like, like Intel, a big sort of uh, meditative mindfulness, you know, positive mm -hmm. health thing within the company. We don't do a lot of that outside the company. That's somebody else's problem. Uh, but we have a lot of those services within. We do, on the other hand, have an external, a big external reaching service mm -hmm. project. So I don't know how many millions of hours were donated to the communities worldwide last year through Google. And that's not disconnected from that other idea. Part of being you know, valued in your community is being service of service to the community. So we do a little bit of that, but we don't have, for example, self-help for the community. We do a lot of external training, mm -hmm. but not mostly technical and content-based rather than we did have, um, for several years, a really interesting quasi-academic relationship in that we had a epidemiology professor who was on staff, you know, 10 hours a week doing a variety of projects, many of which were in the well-being domain, um, in part because uh, through projects with him, we, we could show that we dampened the level of heart attacks and all kinds of other things. Um, so there are opportunities, but they're a little hard to craft at times. Um, and, and again, to start with the, the opening premise of not, here's the thing I do, don't you want it, but rather what's this, what's a thing that's difficult for you and how can we find a, a, an opportunity of mutual benefit? Thank you so much for your time and your opinions on this. Uh, so from the perspective of a PhD student in progress, um, I wanted to get your opinions on what are some of the skills that we can start building on uh, from the 
being in the program itself that could be of value once we graduate and we go into um, looking for these internship opportunities. So it seems that we have this cycle where we're if you're in a PhD program, you're being kind of polished to be an academic that stays in academia and saying that you want to go into industry is kind of like the big no, no. Um, and you're also limited by the um, interest of your advisors and your committee and the kind of research that you can do. And some, sometimes that doesn't really include um, aspects relevant to the tech world. This is up and coming. And if you're in an area where the tech world is still not as um, vibrant as it is maybe in this area um, in San Francisco. So going back to that, I want to start developing the skills that are of value to your type of companies, but I am limited by time and the, you know, the whole being an academic. Um, so how can I start building those skills to be of value to you in the near future? I mean, there's, there's the obvious stuff like methodology toolbox, analysis toolbox, but the one I want to talk about is uh, uh, proactivity. I, I find that the people that I hire or the people that have the most impact um, are able to look at disparate pieces of data and put a cohesive story together that, that creates, talks about an innovation target that we should be going after. And they have put those pieces together themselves. So yes. they're not being asked by their advisor to, hey, I did this paper or these five papers and I want you to test this. Uh, it's more you coming to them saying, I've noticed that there's an interesting twist that you can do here to learn something new and it's my idea. So like being proactive and actively looking to put things together and come up with ideas yourselves is a skill that it takes time to develop. I frame that as a gift with purchase, which I ask my consultants to do with the people in our organization as well, because executives will also ask for analyses that are often not terribly sophisticated. Um, they don't know how to ask for the thing that they need. Uh, so I'll do the thing that they want, and then I'll also do the thing that they need, and, and then we'll spend... I don't know, 30 seconds on the thing they asked for and an hour on the thing that they really need. Uh, honing that skill now is really valuable. Um, and I will push back on people's assertion of I don't have time. I was in a top graduate program when we still had to do all of our math by hand. I worked full time. I taught. I met, did my own research project with my own grant from friggin NASA. So it's not like it was easy. I also raised a disabled child. So like when people, oh, I don't have to, I didn't go to the beach for four years and I lived right at the beach. So let's be clear, not like I was having a great life. I didn't go shopping and I didn't watch television since about the 80s. But I'm sorry to Netflix, my children watch it. <laughs> um, I swear they do. Um, but some of it is deciding what's important in your life. Yeah. And is it, um, is it developing that kind of proactivity, finding a new problem to solve? Right. Um, in graduate school, I very intentionally said, what are the things I'm learning? And I sought out employment experiences that did not align to what I was learning because I figured people would be more willing to take a flyer on me at that point in my life. Um, and I could take one little nugget and pull it in. So I worked in epidemiology, even though I, I worked, I literally worked for the medical school. Um, so so from, from Google's perspective, the, the language we use mm -hmm. uh, is you have a disposition towards action. Mm -hmm. Yes. And uh, so it's very important that you not just do exactly the coursework or stay yeah. contained within the box, but you actually try to identify these interesting topics and go do it. Yes. You're absolutely right. But to your other point, your other question, um, you're here at a conference with all these smart people. You should be running around being as schmoozer as possible, <laughs> right? Your faculty is irrelevant to this. I hate to say it, faculty members, but, you know, the graduate students should be actually trying to make their own connections. So if you're yes. from Podunk U, there's no excuse for not being here and not meeting people who are future employers and talking them up. Get to work on it, mm -hmm. right? Employers and collaborators. Exactly. Yeah. So I just realized that none of you will know anything about the company that I work for. <laughs> uh, because the, the thing is, of course, you've heard of Intel, you've heard of Google, you've heard of Netflix. You probably haven't heard of Jordan. And we're a company that does uh, what we call immersive reality. So we're an augmented and virtual reality tools company. We make tools for building virtual environments. That's something that did not exist when I started my professional career, let alone when I started as an academic, right? It's a thing that's only been around. I mean, it's, it goes back to the 80s and the work of Jaron and Lanier and so forth, so it's not complete without precedent, but as, as an industrial thing, five years, if that. And the reason I mention that is because 
the skills that you will need in your professional career do not exist yet. You're going to have to learn them. So the thing that I'm looking for are fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So math, generally. Uh, communication skills, mm -hmm. ability to write, ability to communicate, all of the thing, the basic blocking and tackling that you learn, and the ability to learn things very quickly. What I'm looking for is relentless curiosity, an eye in the horizon, and the ability to navigate the literature and navigate the kind of para literature of mm -hmm. blogs and Twitter and all of those things and your professional <laughs> network, work out what's important and be prepared to work on the thing that's about to happen. Yeah. That's a very hard skill, but it, that's the skill that I think you need in order to be effective in the tech industry. Something you briefly mentioned that it, it cannot be overstated is your ability to communicate. So yes. in my role in UX research or consumer insights or market research or whatever you want to call it, you inevitably have to get up in front of a bunch of people and tell them what you found in a research study. And if the slides don't make sense, if you're not clearly articulating what they found, if you haven't deleted 80% of what you found just to get to the core of what, what you're trying to communicate is, and people don't come away with action or uh, a way to make impact on the business, then you've ultimately failed. We, we always have a segment in our interview process where people do that. And I can't tell you the number of people I've brought in that are great to talk to on the phone, have like impeccable credentials, mm -hmm. but cannot explain anything so that people who know literally nothing about research and analysis can understand and use that information to make money for the business. I, I spent yesterday afternoon visiting the posters and talking to the students, and that's absolutely right. Yes. There were a lot of students who could not give an elevator pitch, right. and that's an absolutely critical skill. So to augment your idea, um, the ability to talk to somebody and communicate rapidly what the essence of your idea is without doing violence to it is really important. <laughs> uh -huh. yeah. So think in 90-second chunks. Yeah. Yeah. What, one thing which is a, kind of an unpleasant realization I think most of us probably had fairly early in our careers is Everyone is in sales and marketing. <laughs> like, it's part of your job. You have to be able to sell ideas. Right. You have to be able to communicate. You have to be able That's to market right. and network within your organization to build coalitions around the ideas that you think are important. Yeah. That's a critical skill. And one skill that you can learn in academia is teach. Mm -hmm. If you're a good teacher, you'll be able to do that. that that's a good point because you have a lot of opportunity to do that yes so it's not don't think of being a ta as being oh god i have yeah. to do that again <laughs> yeah. yeah um think of it as a development yes you know thing that you get in academics that is really hard to get elsewhere yeah so that's an advantage you have an advantage did you know that so a very practical question. I actually research uh, culture re related to counseling. So when you mentioned Daniel Russell, when you mentioned that you have data <laughs> that is interesting for cultural research, uh, practical question, how to approach and who to approach? Um, the simplest way for Google is to make a, an application for the faculty research awards. So uh, if you're a faculty member, you can just apply. Uh, otherwise, you just need to get your advisor or somebody to apply. Um, and you just go online. The Google search, search query is Google Faculty Research Award. You'll find it. Fill out the form and you can apply. That's it's due in the end of September. So then you can make an application. Um, caution, we only accept like 10%. I mean, it's a competitive business, right? I'm surprised it's 10%, frankly. Uh, or less. But yeah. mostly it's around 10%, yeah. And that's a pot of, you know, several million dollars that we hand out every year. So that's the, that's the way to do it. Uh, yeah, the best example at Netflix is that for the first time in the history of the world, if you have an amazing piece of art, a movie or TV show that normally would be distributed in, to a narrow group of people in a particular country, that art now goes to every country in the world at the exact same day and everyone around the world can watch it in whatever language it is and have that common uh, conversation around it. There's a number of examples of international original content from Germany, from Amsterdam, from other, uh, from Brazil as well. I'm sure people have watched Narcos maybe, that's pretty fairly popular on Netflix. These, these are shows that we would have never had access to in the hit, like before Netflix came around. And we love giving that voice to creators that are global and from other cultures. 
So uh, one of my favorite examples, uh, and Intel, of course, has a proud history of doing lots of good stuff. Uh, one of my favorite examples is building the first documented supply chain that can essentially prove that many of the trace minerals we need for silicon uh, are from conflict-free sources. Um, and that was an enormous lift through our supply chain. It's been an enormous government lift, et cetera. I don't know that we're paying any academics to look at what does that mean for the economic stability of some of these companies or countries? What does this mean for the prevalence of child labor? What does this mean for the prevalence of some of the really brutalization you see that goes with some of those, um, those conflict minerals? Uh, but there is tremendous academic opportunity um, from this interesting intervention. Uh, the same kinds of things where we spend an enormous amount of our goodwill resources bringing electrification, computers, and clean water and whatnot to um, deeply impoverished parts of the world who, frankly, are unlikely to be buying supercomputers. Um, it's part of goodwill. And I think, again, there's enormous interest or interesting research opportunities in um, culture and in sort of anthropologically adjacent studies uh, that could be off gassing of that. Um, most of our research dollars go towards quantum computing and, and things there. So it's not necessarily a source of funding, but it is a source of intervention that can allow some, I think, fascinating research. So for... For, there's a lot of things to say here, but um, we have Google.org, which is specifically an outreach for global good. Yes. Things that we support. So there's a whole, you, just go look it up. You can find out what they do. Um, we also have Google Ventures, which is looking for VC opportunities, uh, specifically with the pro-social thing in mind. Mm -hmm. So that's another, another way to get connected and, and do that kind of stuff. We also, in, in the category of uh, marketing and support for cultural institutions, we have the Google Cultural Institute. So we're not shy on these opportunities. And in specific with respect to academics and psychology, we do have this Google Faculty Research Award. So that's several million bucks every year that we pour directly into academic environments explicitly to support their research goals. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Thank you. Um, I do um, research in the area of social media addiction, technology addiction, quality of life, and all that. And so maybe this would be more for, for Netflix and for Google. But what, what are your companies doing? You know, I think of Netflix, and I think of my daughters in college and binging on Netflix and things like that and, and all this kind of technology. So what, how are you guys approaching that? And I'm, I'm familiar with what Google's doing and, and their concerns about quality of life as well as you know, its interface with technology. So is there anything going on in that direction in your organizations about uh, you know, the well-being, how technology is, you know, has kind of permeated all of our lives and how that's impacting our quality of our lives? Yeah, I mean, with great power comes great responsibility. That's something that we've been preaching about internally for years in our company. And uh, I, I, some of that, there's a little bit of a statistic that a lot of people don't know, is that a lot of you, if you don't know, the cable TV ratings have been steadily declining over the last, let's say, five years. At the same time, Netflix hours have like steadily increased over the last five years. And if you look at the, the data, it's not that people are spending more time watching movies or watching TV shows. It's just that they're replacing the location or the source that they're getting it from. But we do take that extremely seriously at, at Netflix. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work going on, for example, in our recommending algorithms as well, particularly for, you know, how do we uh, do recommendations that are, as de-biased, unbiased as we can do them while maintaining all the other properties we need. Um, so there's a bunch of stuff going on, um, some of which I can't talk about, but um, we do have a, a fair bit of research on this sort of, this sort of area. Um, it, it's an interesting challenge, though, because the world is adversarial, right? There are, there, there are, for example, this whole industry called search engine optimization, which is trying to undo everything you just said, right? Mm -hmm. They're trying to push content to you preferentially, despite what your filters, despite your best intentions are. So um, we have a whole gang of people who do nothing but think about how to, how to ameliorate that. Yeah, we have tools as well. This is particularly for kids. My team works on the kids' experience. Uh, for example, uh, at the end of a show on Netflix, it will typically roll into the next show. But you can turn that off if you don't want your kid that to happen for your kids. And it will just be the end of it, and that's the end of it. 
um, speaking as an employee instead of uh, clearly Google or Netflix, um, it's also a fascinating challenge because for the last five years, I've had non-optional uh, software on my computer that reminds me to take a break every certain amount of time. And every larger interval of time, it completely stops what I'm able to do and makes me like stretch my wrists or whatever. And then after, I think it's after 10 hours of active compute time, it says, you've reached your mandatory daily limit. And I am annoyed and I just close it. Uh, and I think in the five years, I've never actually done the calf stretches and I've just, you know, X'd out of the thing and delayed and been irritated by it. Uh, so it's a source of stress as opposed to, oh, that's right. I'm going to be well now in the middle of my, please, let's everyone meditate for three minutes in the middle of my five minutes I have with you. Um, so it's a fascinating to try and figure out how you create that because the frontal assault, uh, I think is, um, not super effective. If what we're talking about here is, and this has come up a couple of times now, moral responsibility in the tech industry, I think it's absolutely clear the tech industry has profound moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. And again, speaking as an employee rather than as a representative joint, one of the most powerful tools you have is to vote with your feet. Mm -hmm. The reason I chose to go work for Flipboard, the company I worked for before I worked for Jorn, is because I cared very deeply about the news industry and it was entirely obvious that they had no business model. <laughs> and somebody had to provide them with one because it turns out that having a news industry that's entirely beholden to a small number of interests and is funded entirely through uh, outrage-generated advertising <laughs> has strongly negative consequences for democracy, right? Regardless as a result of it, that's not a situation you want to be in. And I'm, I'm not sure that my work there made an enormous amount of difference, but that's why I went to work there rather than somewhere else. And when I went to work for Jaunt, it's that virtual reality is an ex and augmented reality are extremely powerful technologies that have to be used responsibly. Mm -hmm. And I want to work on things that matter and I want to do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. So it's not speaking as a representative of Flipboard or Jaunt, because I, I don't speak for the companies in this regard, it's speaking purely as myself. I feel a moral responsibility to only work on things that let me sleep at night. Mm -hmm. And that's the most powerful tool I have is to, when I'm presented with something that I find repugnant, walk away from it. Like, it's on all of us individually to do that. Thank you for doing this panel. Um, I just had a question. As a faculty member, we often, as Alexis is saying, teach the students what they want and a lot of what they need. Thinking abstractly is really powerful and important, even for applied stuff. But my quick question to you, because I always try to give them career advice somewhere in the course, what would you want to see more of and less of from your applicants? Well, I'm, I'm going to say the obvious answer, which is more programming, more data analysis skills, um, uh, and less confusion about what it is, the communication thing, less confusing communication. Um, there is a, one of the things I have to beat out of my new PhDs, uh, is that comprehensiveness does not equal goodness. Um, nobody wants to read a 35 page, 10 point font deck, uh, going through the entire literature review. Um, I have to convince people and it generally takes about a year to deprogram them, um, that there is benefit in the comprehensiveness. But no one wants to read that except your professor. So you do that in the research meeting. You ensure that you've covered all of the bases. You analyze something six ways from Sunday. So you have absolute confidence in your finding. It's not some non-replicable heap of garbage. But then when you communicate with a stakeholder, there is an entirely different way to do that. Uh, and it's about finding the nugget of truth, not about justifying your entire existence. And um, I did a piece of work, actually, uh, for SIOP, my Division 4 of APA about 10 years ago, looking at what employers actually wanted from new PhDs that they weren't getting and methodologically really interesting. Um, but the chief thing that across these sort of several thousand respondents of actual employers employing uh, newly minted PhDs was the ability to sort of be succinct and pointed about the thing that made a difference instead of defending a dissertation with every project. Uh, another thing is uh, the ability to uh, take a chance sometimes. Um, yeah. So I, the, I struggled with this as well, coming out of academics. 
I, I wanted to button up and know everything so that I would be as sure as well, humanly is. possible about my recommendation for some kind of innovation target and eventually learned that you don't need 100% of information. You can get 75% of information and be right most of the time. And it also takes about like a tenth of the time to do that. <laughs> so trying to find some flexibility in terms of thoroughness and impact is an interesting balance that people have to learn. The, there's an interesting related skill to that, which just occurred to me from what you said, and it's risk assessment. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Often the time, the urge to be buttoned up, if the downside isn't very large, if it's not, you know, click through rate might go down 1%, try it. If click through rate goes down 1%, change it back. Right. Yeah. That, that's one of the flexibilities you have in these kind of large systems where you can yeah. run experiments is you want experiments to fail. You actively want experiments to fail because that's the only time you ever learn anything. That's true. Uh, so, I tell people all the time, I was trained as a scientist, and um, I only expect like 30% of what I do to be useful. And that's like Hall of Fame stuff, man. You, get, you bat 300, you're doing pretty well. Uh, and if you're not failing, you've been, yeah. the only way to find the boundary of possibility is when you've now passed it. So I like to run over the boundary of possibility all the time. And then I see it in the rearview mirror and dial myself back. So another thing you guys just made me think about was um, the pace of work is very different mm -hmm. oh, God, in yeah. our world versus the academic world. And as the editor of several special issue journals, it drives me crazy. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I recently finished a, a special issue of a journal that took was two years in production, which you, some of you might think of as fast. But all, trust me, all the papers are now obsolete. Totally out of date. I, and I'm thinking, why did I do this? Right. So to your point, right, I do not need a 35 page, uh, you know, mm -hmm. exegesis about this topic, because by the time you finish it, it's irrelevant. Right. So there's a pace thing that you have to learn as well. In, in my specific area, just as an example, I do a lot of work around, I build system deep neural networks. Right, that's what I do for a living. The so first, sexy, by the way. The, the first, uh, and, and, ever, and you've heard these terms, right, and these yeah. are industrially important. The first like, significant paper in that was published by Alex, Alex Krzyzewski pretty much exactly five years ago. The field is moving at warp speed. It's gone from this obviously doesn't work to this is the only thing that the biggest companies in Silicon Valley do inside five years. The, the, you, the pace of innovation is unreal. Uh, another skill that's useful is uh, triangulation. Mm -hmm. So uh, oftentimes people will be good at one thing and let's say that's, I don't know, data analysis, or maybe for me it's quant research, or maybe Dan says he's good at qualitative research and quant quantitative research. If you yourself or you plus other partners, either internal data scientists or qualitative researchers, whatever, can get together and attack a question mm -hmm. from multiple angles and kind of converge in the same place, then there's a lot more confidence that that is going to be worthwhile, like taking to A-B test or, or trying out with members than something that you just did a survey and a thousand people said that sounded like a good idea. Right, that one data point isn't really going to help you uh, bat 300. Uh, so trying to find different ways of answering a question and see if you get convergence of answers. And that's a skill that needs to be learned as well. The, uh, the other thing, this gets a little bit back to incentives, but that I would notice uh, is I've known many professors who've done essentially the same work for their entire 30 year career. And they've done the 1% of increased prediction each time. Uh, and that is really a very fine way to make an academic career. It is entirely uninteresting to me. I don't want to get 1% better at a thing I'm already really, really good at. I want to get 50% better at a thing I'm not great at yet. Uh, and that gets down to a risk assessment. And so in this case, the risk is higher at just getting a teeny weeny bit better at the thing that's already pretty good as opposed to going out in some new area where I feel slightly stupid because I don't know it all already, the path ahead is not entirely clear, the risk of failure is higher, but the payoff for success is orders of magnitude higher. Uh, so doing that calculation and, and having that courage, I guess. Um, can you talk a little about like the mentorships um, like in the early stage of your um, career? Thank the you. mentorships that we had? Uh, yeah, like in the early stage of the yeah. career, because like um, the mentorship in um, tech market definitely is like different from uh, when you were in school. So can you talk a little about that? Thank you. Um, I did a postdoc in industry. So after I graduated, I did a postdoc at Altria, which is formerly known as Philip Morris on sensory science. 
uh, working on reduced harm tobacco systems, basically. Um, I don't smoke, so I was learning a lot, but it was a difficult topic for me to get excited about. And the internship or the, uh, the postdoc lasted, let's say, a year. And then I moved on to other sensory uh, science uh, uh, companies afterwards. But because I had had that experience, I was able to get a job, full-time job, at another company that did similar stuff uh, that, uh, that was Unilever. So it was really about getting that postdoc uh, for me. I was thinking about... Uh well, there's formal and informal mentorships, right? Right, and the formal mentorships, I when I have a, a, a student that I'm mentoring, I will put them on my calendar. To make sure we do the. Con it's just you just do it. Fine. Um, and there are better and worse relationships, but whatever. Um, I think the most interesting ones, though, are the informal ones, the informal uh, mentor mentee relationships, where the student is interesting enough to me that I want to stay in a relationship with him or her. And those people end up getting hired oftentimes. So uh, there's also the mentorship of, of be, for example, being a, on a PhD candidate panel, right? So there's a bunch of these things. And I think senior people in the field, in my field in particular, really go out and, and encourage these things and try to make them happen. I hope it happens universally, but they're incredibly productive. So uh, I went in terms of my career, PhD, postdoc, both of which very conventional kind of academic relationships, and I'm still in touch with my academic mentors from those periods. And after that, I went and founded a company. So <laughs> from that point, I was basically raised by wolves. <laughs> uh, and that was entirely the kind of informal mentorships you describe, and those are the ones that were valuable. Is people who I met who were more experienced in the industry, who th yeah. Or, or in startups or in uh, a lot of people were from the investment community and who saw something in me and they weren't expecting anything from it initially. It wasn't like they were going to invest in my company or hire me or, you know, have me be able to do them favors because I wasn't in a position to do so. They were essentially taking a punt going, you're interesting. And in the future, I think we can probably be useful to each other and I'm going to help you get there. And that comes down to the thing I was saying earlier of, just meet people and be curious and generous. Mm -hmm. And that puts you in a good position to develop those relationships. And then when you're a little further on in your career, the generosity part becomes important because you have to pay it forward. Yeah. And to build up something Alexis was saying earlier, part of that is, you know, uh, on the flip side is being, uh, I guess, self-aware of where your skills are at each time that you're interested in making a career move. Do you, do you think I didn't want to work at Netflix like 15 years ago? Of course I did, right? But but they wouldn't even look at me at that time, right? So you've got to take these steps, and some of those steps are hard because you've got to move to a different country. You got to you got family, and you got to pull them out of school in order to grow your skills. And eventually, you land in a place where you're really comfortable and really excited, and then you hold on to that job and you work as hard as you can to make a difference in that company. Um, but it is a process. And I, I mean, I remember just being naive and thinking to myself, like, you know, I got really good grades and I have a PhD. So, like, who wouldn't want to hire me? <laughs> Nobody wants to hire you. Right. <laughs> um, your initial question was about the mentorships we'd had early in our career. Um, and there's a certain amount that, of course, goes to what the panelists panelists have said about uh, nurturing and do, paying it forward at various times in your life and, and helping people see something in you. Uh, some of that is also in an approach of curiosity as opposed to an approach of, I'm trying to prove myself right now. Of course, if you're smart, you do want to prove yourself, but there's a sort of a humility and curiosity, and um, I don't want to say it's about paying homage, um, but genuinely understanding the boundaries of your capability and the robustness of what nearly anyone you meet can teach you. Uh, so I actually learned a tremendous amount doing entirely um, sort of orthogonal things to my job now. I learned an entire amount, an enormous amount in the short period I spent in the professional theater. I learned an enormous amount in the short time that I spent in the federal government. 
I learned an enormous amount doing epidemiological research about how do you get people over whom you have almost no control to do the things that you want them to do. So learned about influence, learned about different analytical methods, learned different mental models that I could apply to new projects. I had opportunities to work overseas where I made an complete ass of myself on a regular basis, but I learned an enormous amount. And now I can... Um, I can at least tell the inside jokes from a lot of different professions, uh, which goes a long way, frankly. You can get a pretty good relationship if you got the right inside joke. Um, but some of it was just that, um, that curiosity and that willingness to say, I know, I don't know, a tenth of a percent of what's actually knowable in the world. Even though I've got a PhD and even though I'm the smartest cookie I think I've ever met, um, I still know an almost immeasurably small amount uh, against the the universe of what is knowable and um, everyone you meet, it sounds so trite, everyone you meet can teach you something, uh, but be on the lookout for that uh, and you'll end up an awful lot smarter. And then realize there's actually a literature on upwards mentoring. So realize that these young people that you see something in, in this case, you may be one of them, um, you are providing a benefit back as well. Um, I have an, uh, probably too many people who are 10 years and more younger than me that I have a relationship with, and I hesitate to call it mentoring because I get at least as much from them, probably more, frankly, although I, they won't see it that way, but probably more. I get at least as much from them as they're getting from me. Okay, and we're uh, just about out of time. Um, so I want to thank um, Andrew and Zach and Daniel and Alexis for this uh, super interesting and informative uh, panel. Um, thank you very much. Um, I also want to uh, thank uh, Camille uh, Galbo for organizing this and for Sage uh, for putting all this together. Um, and uh, Sage is having um, an, uh, an event uh, uh, at their booth with some free snacks, so feel free to go up uh, and visit their booth right now um, after after the panel. And uh, thank you very much for um, for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.